Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 in Asheville. This is the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Salagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world. We just passed the 100th anniversary of the murder by incarceration and hounding of Mexican revolutionary anarchist communist Ricardo Flores Magón on the 21st of November, 2022. For this hour or so, I spoke with Mitchell Cohen Verder, co-author of the 2005 AK Press book Dreams of Freedom, a Ricardo Flores Magón reader, also available for free from archive.org. We talked about RFM's life, ideas, and legacy. Apologies for the sound quality. Mitchell was on Wi-Fi at a hostel in Cambodia for the conversation. We'll link a few articles of Mitchell's in the show notes as well, but you can find much of his work at theanarchistlibrary.org. Also, Chicano anarchist communist prisoner of war, Shinach Lee, also known as Alvaro Luna Hernandez, who is held by the state of Texas on some BS charges, had a support rally in Austin, Texas on November 21st of this year. There's a link in the show notes to a recording that someone passed us of him telling his story about a decade ago. And you can also learn more about his case and how to support him at freealvaro.net. Would you please introduce yourself with your name, preferred pronouns, and any other information about yourself that would give context to the listening audience for this conversation? Sure. My name is Mitchell Cowan Verder. My pronouns are he, him. And for the purposes of this conversation, I'm the author of Dreams of Freedom, a Ricardo Flores Magon reader, a book about Ricardo Flores Magon. I've also published some translations of his work independently of that. Can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to write this book, Dreams of Freedom, uh, Ricardo Flores Magón, Reader? Like, where were you at? What was going on in your life? And what what inspired that? Yeah, so, you know, um, that came out of a weird period of my life. We were squatting in Boston, and our squat got closed down, so I just ran off to Mexico. Uh, and there, like, on the beach, I met some two... Um, just Chilango, Anarcho Punks, uh, Luis Cardenas, and Jorge. It was the Año Siete Daño of Ricardo Flores Magón. And they were like, hey, you're an anarchist. He's an anarchist. We're all anarchists. You should check him out. He's a cool guy. And I was like, all right, yeah, totally. I mean, these are, these are great guys, and I totally trusted and honored them. So, uh, you know, came back up to um, the States, Went to a Zapatista benefit and just was like, oh, here's a book by Ricardo First Run, well, let me check him out. And uh, wow, I just was like really blown away by just how beautiful and intense his writing is. It's just, it's really kind of unlike, it's, it's so beautiful and so over the top in so many ways. I really want to carry the message forward. So a couple a couple years later, I had some free time, and I just translated his first play. Uh, he wrote two plays, self-published, bilingual translation, English and Spanish, with, with the grammar lessons between the two. The objective was to kind of get a conversation between, you know, two languages, two cultures, heterodidactic, teaching each other sort of message. Just, you know, scanned copies at Kinko's and just, you know, put it out with a, you know, stapler. And then many years later, uh, or a couple of years later, uh, AK Press was like, hey, you're, which I definitely wasn't, will you write a book about him? And um, at that time, I, I got like a temp job at Berkeley as a, like a, a person who calls and asks like terrible research questions. I got fired after like a month because I wasn't very good at it, but I was able to get a library card. And so with that library card, I was able to, uh, you know, put this together. I was really helped out a lot by, by Lillian Castillo, Castillo Speed at the Ethics Studies Library. Really helpful. Also, you know, Ward S. Albo, you know, who uh, kind of wrote the authoritative, in my view, biography of Flores Magon, Always a Rebel, was, was very helpful, influential. He just passed away this past year. Really a, a great... Tremendous loss for for just the world of you know radicalism of, of Flores Magon scholarship. Of you know he knew uh, like Nicholas Bernal, who was one of uh, Flores Magon's old comrades, and just did a lot of great work. Uh, also, we lost uh, another great scholar, Saul Neely, who um, 
As my philosophical compatriot, we're both uh, uh, students of the work of uh, Manuel Levinas, who's the philosopher of the other person, and he combined that that philosophy of otherness with a focus on Klinglit uh, or Cherokee culture, and did a lot of really amazing work in prison education and Cherokee Klinglit culture, and as well as uh, you know. French and German philosophy, which is, is how I know him. So. Cool. Yeah, thank you very much yeah. for that. And would you talk a bit about, like, give sort of a framework for people understanding uh, Magone, maybe talk about Ricardo's life, just sort of a thumbnail sketch of, of where he came up and, and yeah, what, what all happened? Cool. Yeah. So that, that's a, a pretty large question. So feel free to ask me any directed questions. But, you know, I mean, the, the, the history I lay out in the book is, you know, you know, there's there's colonization, you know, Mexico by the Spanish in the, whatever, the 1492, 15th century. You know, and that brings the church, that brings the imperial power of Spain, and it brings the economic depredations of, I think, pre-capitalism. You know, and that, that went on for a good, like, 300 years. Then in uh, 1810 or something like that, Hidalgo, parish priest, leads a revolution against the Spanish and uh, you know, Mexican independence happens. Then in like the 1860s, Benito Juarez, this indigenous guy from Oaxaca, walks to the Mexico City, becomes the president, and he, he brings in all these liberal reforms. And here liberal means a bunch of uh, different things. So it means, on the one hand, uh, kind of eliminating or curbing back the, the power of the church, but it also means like a liberalization, like neoliberalization of property. So uh, along with the, the curbing back of the power of the church comes the expropriation of, of not just church lands, church property, but also like community property. So those start to get privatized under his... Um, uh, under his presidency, not, not not really his fault, but you know there was a a group of of scientificos uh, of uh, positivists uh, who were kind of influential uh, intellectually during the time. Anyways, so he uh, 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 rules for a while, and then there's this ambitious general Porfirio Diaz who was the lead general in the Cinco de Mayo selling the, the French. And it executes a coup against Pino de Juarez and becomes the dictator, essentially, and just brings back the power of the church. And, you know, his, his governing principle is, you know, whatever is good for, for business is good for Mexico. So really ramps up the exploitation, the, the resource extraction from Mexico invites in, you know, U.S. capital, allows them, like, free access to, uh, to like, the mines in the Sonora in the north, and then, I think, to tobacco and coffee in the south. And there's, like, literally, like, slavery, uh, like, literally slavery uh, among the Yaqui and then Sonora, and the Ma I'm not actually sure who, who what the tribes are in, 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 the, in the south, but people, uh, natives were... were conquered in the wars uh, that he has executed against them and transported to these, these kind of slave-like conditions where they perish in a year. And then, you know, there was like other, there's like a ton of horrible super exploitation of, of, of the peasants throughout the Diaz regime, which was from like 1880 to 1910. So Flores Magan, uh, born in an indigenous village in Oaxaca, where kind of people just, you know, work together to support each other. And so his father passed away, and his mother moved them to Mexico City and, you know, wanted him to, you know, succeed in life. So he uh, went to a uh, legal school, which is like an undergraduate degree, uh, trained to be a lawyer. And there he, uh, you know, started to write this newspaper called The Regeneration, which outlined sort of the injustices of the, of the Tiaz regime, and that, you know, again, was the, the slavery, the enslavement of uh, indigenous people in the tobacco fields. The mines is a different, that's, that's a different labor exploitation. 
You're paid in script, for instance, right? There was this debt peonage where sort of you were always paid by the company. You lived in a company town. You were paid by the company. And so you were always in debt to the company. So you were effectively a slave of the company. And when you died, it was passed on to your children. So uh, Frozen Wagon wrote uh, this inflation newspaper against uh, uh, the system. You know, also corruption of the judges. The haciendas were just, you know, rape of the women. What else? Uh, just, you know, just really multifaceted exploitation uh, throughout Mexico. Can you say a word about that, about the, um, like the sexual assault being systematized through the political chiefs that Diaz ruled with? So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the details of it that well, yeah. But I know it's a pretty common practice, just that, you know, the, the, the dueño, the lord of the property, just pretty much had absolute uh, control over the people who lived on the land. And, uh, you know, just this, this you know, uh, Diaz's uh, rule was it was an autocracy. And so, you know, whatever the boss, the political boss, the governor, the judge said or did or wanted to do was just, you know, his word was law and you couldn't get around it. So maybe it wouldn't have been dissimilar in some ways to the, like, systematized use of, of sexual assault and in, in, uh, slavery in the U.S. against uh, people of African descent? I, I don't know if it was systematized per se, um, but it just was... Uh, uh, you know, it's, in, in Mexico, they talk about a, a lot of the impunidad, so impunity. It's just like you can see whatever the fuck you want if you have power. Uh, I mean, that, that's still the case today, but it was more autocratic uh, back then. Okay, thank you. So uh, around the time that the first man wrote that paper, I think it was Diaz uh, made a statement to, to some newspaper saying, hey, I'm giving the church all this power again. So that inspired um, some reformist people to organize against Yaz, and they started this uh, the Liberal Party. And here again, the idea of liberal is to take back power, like absolute power from the uh, from the autocracy, from the church, but not necessarily like an economic reform. So uh, first, we're going to join that movement, and you know the first party conference. You know people kind of were giving these pretty mild-mannered critiques of the Diaz regime. And, you know, first Moran goes up on stage and, you know, gives, I'm sure, what was an eloquent speech. And concludes it with, like, you know, the statement, you know, Diaz, you know, his regime is, is the den of thieves. And there's, like, a harsh silence. And, you know, he repeats it, you know, you know Diaz's regime is den of thieves. And, you know, people, like, kind of timidly clap. And then, like, the third time he says it again, you know, people, like, you know, roar with applause. Or, so the story goes, at least. But, you know, first one was, it was, was very, like, daring and kind of outspoken. And this landed him in a ton of trouble. He was put in jail numerous times in Mexico for, for being so outspoken, for publishing articles. Once about a political boss in Oaxaca, I think. And finally, there was a, 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 a ruling by the Diaz regime that if anybody in the country publishes an article by, you know, Ricardo or his brothers, you know, the press will be uh, dismantled and the publisher will be put in jail. So Bergman fled to the United States and kept on publishing from there. And not just publishing, but also uh, doing his best to organize the peasants and the workers, so both the uh, agrarian people and the industrial people, into uh, a revolutionary assemblage. So coordinated, I mean, it's pretty fucking incredible. I mean, it's sort of like pre-internet social uh, media, I guess. But he would, uh, you know, they published these newspapers, uh, Regeneration, and this would be, uh, you know, delivered to these small villages where, you know, the agrarian villages and then also to uh, industrial towns. And, you know, a lot of those people were illiterate. And so, you know, the person who could read would, like, read the, the articles aloud to them. And they'd learn this, you know, the message is, uh, you know, revolutionary fervor and of just what was going on around the country. 
And also, you know, there was a solicitation, hey, if you have any ideas for reform uh, or for stuff that you would like changed, send them to us. Here's our address in St. Louis, Missouri. And through that, through that channel, they were able to kind of collect all these recommendations for reform. While that was going on, the first one was like, you know, survived like a couple of assassination attempts. And I think it was put in prison at least once. This is like between 1904 and 1906. Yeah, an agent from Mexico broke into his offices and tried to kill him, but he jumped out of a window or something like that. So they moved it to St. Louis, Missouri and was getting solicitations from there. Agents were always pursuing him. So the, the, at first the Mexican government was sending agents, and then the U.S. government was, and, you know, the Pinkertons and the Thomas Furlong and private agents. So at first run, like, went from Texas to St. Louis to San Francisco to Montreal to Toronto to... Los Angeles, all like fleeing persecution, and landed in jail at least four or five times in Mexico and in the U.S. for his political activities. Anyways, that's a big part of the story. I mean, he spent like a third of his life in jail because he was so outspoken against the depredations of the state and of capitalism. Anyways, so in 1906, they published uh, the PLM, the uh, Partido Liberal Mexicano. They published this program for reform. And it's this huge list of recommendations for agrarian reform, for land reform, for industrial reform, which really was unseen until then. And parts of it are, are, were so forward-looking that they became integrated into the, the actually quite progressive uh, Mexican constitution, the, the Ar Article 123, the, the labor laws in Mexico, are sort of drawn from that, that initial visionary document. So that, that was like uh, one of the initial steps or, or achievements of Flores Magan, the Partido Liberal Mexicano, uh, and his cohorts. And then also, like, the method that they use to, like, draw that from their readership is also pretty amazing for the time and with the resources that they had available, right? It's amazing from the time. I mean, so there's this whole network of special delegates who are these people who just kind of run messages between various clubs throughout Mexico, throughout the southwestern United States, particularly along the, the borders of Arizona and Sonora. Yeah, I think I think those are, are really the hotbeds. And some of those dudes are really interesting. You know, there's this guy, Palomares, who is this Mayo Indian who also grew up in, like, this utopian anarchist community of, you know, was running stuff between the mines in Cananea, Sonora, and the Yaquis who were enslaved doing, I think, timber production. I, I actually don't remember right now, sort of enslavement, uh, they, what, what they were affirming. And he, uh, you know, he attempted to assassinate the dictator. Just a really interesting character. Another, um, Praxedes Guerrero, you know, ran between the, the mines and the... Anyways, a lot of interesting characters were, were delivering messages to and fro. That, and then, you know, people were somehow transmitting messages to this center in St. Louis, Missouri, which oftentimes Flores Mon was not even there, you know, because he had to flee for his safety. Oftentimes it's uh, only like Librado Rivera, another member of the junta, who was kind of taking care of the just the manual compilation of all this uh, all this stuff. So yeah, that, this was also their downfall in, in certain ways because you know, as everyone knows, OPSEC is pretty hard and. Um, that sort of distributed uh, uh, information gathering leaves open the possibility for a lot of infiltration, a lot of spying. Even when you're encrypting, like they were. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's actually like, like, I think either once or I think twice he was thrown into jail on that, for that reason, for a violation of the postal code, which was... I can't remember exactly, but it, it's it's sending. I mean, probably like like revolutionary messages, you know, by post, or, or perhaps interfering with um, another nation's politics from the United States by post. But so yeah, they they were reading his mail and threw him into jail. I think twice for that. 
And it's, that, that takes us to 1906. 1906, there were a few, like, ambitious but, but failed attempts at revolution throughout these small towns in Mexico. I think first Ms. Magan goes to jail again uh, in 1907. Uh, and then in, in 1908, I think even from prison, the Partido Liberal Mexicano was able to you know, spur another set of revolutionary attempts in 1908, but those also were kind of too scattered to, to really be successful. And then, um, but that sort of, uh, uh, the 1908 arrest brought him into uh, the focus of like North American, the USA, uh, like socialists and communists and anarchists. You know, people in the U.S. Uh, started to speak out about the way that Boris Magan was treated. And then, um, you know, John Kenneth Turner went down to, well, the Yucatan and um, I think Oaxaca, a few different places in, in Mexico, and wrote this incredible book, Barbarous Mexico, which just de- uh, described in, in very unsparing detail just the horrible conditions that, you know, that, that, that these people in the mines and in the haciendas, the tobacco farms, were put under the, the again, this, this whole thing about, you know, that Diaz, the dictator, would go to war against these Indian tribes, seize their lands. When they fought back, you know, the, not only would the lands be, repos- would be uh, expropriated from them, but the people would be sent to, you know, these slave camps, basically, and um, would be worked to death, like literally, like they would die within a year because they'd just be worked unsparingly. Anyways, so uh, John Kenneth Turner became involved. Uh, a couple other prominent socialists became involved. Uh, Emma Goldman, uh, Alexander Berkman became involved in their movement. But first of all, I think he was put in jail even more. And then in 1910, he gets out of jail and, you know, with a huge uproar uh, or a huge celebration. I, I seem to remember uh, Emma Golden was, was kind of instrumental in raising the funds to help him get out at least once. But this was like on the eve of the Mexican Revolution. And uh, Fosman sort of knew that it was going to break out, made, wrote a bunch of gorgeous pieces about how, you know, not only do we have to struggle for like political reform, we have to expropriate the land and the industries from the capitalists are exploiting, you know, the working class and the, the you know, the peasants. Uh, I miss a better word for peasants. Uh, agrarian, uh, the farmers. Campesinos? The campesinos, thank you. He's publishing this stuff, but the Mexican Revolution breaks out anyways under this guy, Madero, who's kind of... Um, you know, it's kind of just like an upper crust, rich family, uh, liberal, and only wants kind of political reforms for Mexico, like a, a, a curbing back of the autocracy under Diaz, a curbing back of the church's power, but still leaving in place the economic exploitation. And Flores Magana is like, no, don't follow him. But unfortunately, at that time, and because Flores Magana had been in jail for so long, wasn't really able to muster the military forces or, or, or really the, to spread the political message and have the, the tools at his disposal. So much of the organization, not just Flores Magana, but also the organization at large, had been really um, infiltrated and uh, you know, different centers had been attacked and, and undermined. So they didn't have like the wherewithal. When the, when the revolution actually broke out, they weren't able to mount a resistance unique to their own. There was an attempt to take over Tijuana, which the IWW, you know, came out in droves to support that that effort to take over Tijuana to set up a base of, for the revolution, for the anarchist revolution, Tijuana. That eventually was beat back by, by Madero, the, you know, the Lewis, uh, who had fought off the dictator. So from then on, 
you know, the Mexican Revolution chugs on without Flores Morgan's direct influence. You know, with the, the, the kind of the military defeat at Tijuana, Flores Morgan doesn't really have anything, like a fighting chance. Yeah, he's still, he's putting out articles, like all the time, you know, about, hey, you know, don't follow Madero, you know, no, don't follow a leader, don't put your faith in a person, don't, this personalismo, you know, don't put your faith in an individual, you know, it's about, it's about political justice, it's about, you know, without the, but economic, it's about, you know, the land, the land is for all, terra liberta, land and liberty, so, you know, the, the land belongs to the people who work it, you know, private property is the product of ex, uh, expropriation and violence by, you know, the rich and privileged, that, that should really be our goal, not, not you know, putting our faith in leaders. And the Mexican Revolution is just, you know, I, I can't even remember all of the clowns who kind of take power one after another. Uh, Madera Falls, and then Carranza, and then Obregón, and there's a couple other guys in there too. Uh, but, but each one of them kind of comes to power, and it's like, I am the figurehead of the revolution. And those men repeat again and again, like, don't put your faith in this guy. He's just going to, you know, he'd say, toss a good game, but he's just going to fuck you over in the end. And, and that just happens over and over again. There's actually a really horrible story about Carranza. Carranza cut a deal with the, um, the anarcho-syndicalist labor union, uh, Casa de Mun Obrero Mundial, Obrero Mundial. Mm -hmm. in uh, 1916. It's like, hey, if you, you know, pledge your loyalty to me, I will give you, like, union bargaining rights or, or something like that. And then he, like, sends them out, these so-called red battalions. He's like, oh, there are these reactionaries in the villages being controlled by this, you know, terrorist, Emiliano Zapata. And so the anarcho syndicalist student workers went to Morelos and, and destroyed the Zapatista movement. Really a horrible story. That's under President Carranza. And then immediately after Carranza, you know, does that, you know, publishes this law saying, you know, anybody who organizes a strike will be put to death. So it immediately breaks the promise. Yeah, it seems like in that instance, too, like their, uh, Carranza was really like playing off of anti-indigenism, like a uh, view that the people in the in the countryside are backwards. The fact that they were carrying like religious relics or or that religious relics, but like signage and talking about God and stuff. There was this sort of like split between materialism of the industrial age versus the backwards age that the church ruled and all these other dynamics. It's a really sad story. It's a horrible story. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Anyway, so 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 Florence is publishing that stuff about the Mexican Revolution, but at this point. <clears throat> What's really um, getting him into trouble is not the Mexican government. They're, they're sort of like forgotten about him. And they're, they've cut off their attempts to assassinate him, to put him in jail, coerce the U.S. government to put him in jail. Actually, that's not entirely true. Uh, but what starts to get him into trouble is the U.S. government. And they become more and more aware that he is publishing sort of these radical, like, anarchist propaganda. And during this period, actually, he becomes more and more pronounced as an anarchist that this British anarchist, William Owen, takes over the English language part of the paper. Uh, Voltairean Declare starts writing articles for, for, for Regeneration, the, their magazine. And Emma Goldman and, and Alexander Berkman become more and more involved in, in just supporting them. Kropotkin also, uh, you know, comes out and so, you know supports them in their movement. Anyways, what what eventually gets him into um, the last bit of trouble? Uh, I mean, and you know, he was jailed. I mean, at least like five, five or six times. You know, was again spent like a third of his time in in in, in, in prison through his life in prison. What finally gets him into jail, like the last time, is when World War I breaks out and Flores Magon writes this, you know, this article saying, you know, hey, you know, don't go to war. You know, the only reason that you're going to war is to uh, protect the property of the rich. You know, there, there's like no, you know, your country and, you know, versus my country, you know, there's no... Um, that's an illusion. That, that, that nationalist fervor is an illusion. 
and it's uh, the plotting together of, of the state and capital, and basically you're just fighting for your own exploitation. That happened at a really bad time, so that's uh, 1917, uh, 1916, and President Wilson, there's actually a bunch of laws, but uh, Wilson, I think, uh, uh, published these you know, anti-anarchist laws, anti-sedition laws, and then on top of that, there is explicitly anything that is given, uh, any talk or any propaganda promulgated which is against the war effort, that will harm the war effort, is punishable by imprisonment and whatever else. So, you know, that, that Ricardo Flores Milan was, was so outspoken against the war, against capital, against the state, is finally what, what does him in and landed in jail again for, a, I don't know, like a, a, an absurdly long term. I mean, at this point, he had been imprisoned. It was like a 20-year term, I think. Oh, a 20-year sentence, yeah. He had been imprisoned so many times and had lived such a rough life that his his health was pretty gone, would not survive it. And so he eventually died at Leavenworth in 1922, imprisoned for his agitation, for his anarchy. Yeah, and like uh, announced as like November 21st, so we're about to hit the 100th anniversary. Right, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for that exhaustive, like, I mean, it's like it's you said, it's life. such, yeah. it's such a, it's such a long, like, and storied life that that person lived. And like you said, yeah. with the position that he was in with his health by the end of his life, there were times when he was, he and the others were living on the, like, they were on the run basically from like in the U S uh, they were on the run at, from like 1900, 1904, or whatever in Mexico. And then in 1905, they maybe had a couple of years before they started getting really chased down. And then they were jumping up to Canada and across the uh, United States and all over, like not being able to carry jobs because they were in hiding from furlong or from the Pinkertons or from the U S yeah. government or from the Arizona or Texas Rangers. And just so eating very little, you know, sleeping very little in prison. He's been sick since like he got sick when he first got incarcerated in Belen prison in Mexico City for his oh, early yeah. activism, like against the Diaz regime. So one thing that strikes me from reading through the biography that you published in the beginning of Dreams of Freedom and also I, I read Bad Mexicans by Lettel Hertel, uh, Hernandez, excuse me, uh, recently. But there's all these critiques of other revolutionary leaders from Mexico or from abroad, like new, uh, like the New Times from France or whoever, saying, yeah. like, why don't you go down there and do the fighting? And none of them seem to understand the fact that his body is just... Like his eyesight oh, yeah. is going, he walks with a limp, like his yeah. lungs are super weak. All of these bits of incarceration, like in the US, whether it be in Washington State or in Arizona or whatever, there's always this like fear on behalf of his loved ones or supporters and expectation or hope by the authorities that he will die in incarceration. Like, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, thank yeah, you for telling your story. It's, it's insane. Uh, I mean, and uh, you called it. I mean, he was in prison in Mexico again and again and again, and then goes up to Texas, and then I don't know how long he was in Texas, but, you know, uh, Diaz sent an agent to assassinate him after, I mean, I don't think it's more than a year that he lived, you know, without trouble, and then, you know, goes up to St. Louis and, it's insane, yeah. So, to, just to, I've got a couple of questions pointing back to some of the yeah. uh, some of what you've talked about, or some of the points that you made in other articles that you've written. Um, so, to go back to the the PLM, the Partido Liberal Mexicano. Yeah. So, like a lot of the the Benito Juarez era was under the banner of this liberalism, and they had this yeah. like struggle with the over the decades. They had to struggle with the conservatives who were more. The closer to monarchists or were like into the church having much more control. They definitely like were reactionaries that didn't believe in any degree of even representational popular control. And so they had these struggles around things like series of laws like La Reforma. And this yeah. is where things like slavery was abolished officially, which is why yeah. there was so many struggles in Texas with Sam Houston and his bunch um, because all these Americans were coming down and trying to take space where they could have uh, bring their southern slave, like 
southern held slaves like down to these territories and oh wow and so like and and there had been slavery under you know in the missionary system too under the spanish and early mexico so this is like super super important like reforms to push but so the plm was developing as a movement as primitive accumulation into the hands of anglo magnates and mexican aristocracy under the porfiriato as they call it, like the Diaz regime's sure. time, cemented. And seeing the displacement, enslavement, and murder of indigenous communities around Mexico, notably, as you mentioned, the Yaqui, uh, who were moved for forced labor to Oaxaca to work in plantations and also were just like moved around, and as was covered in that journalism. But uh, though the PLM itself started off fighting for enforcement of those reforms from the Reforma era that were won by liberals to defend like to a degree indigenous land titles and an end to slavery. Can you talk a little bit about how the PLM like engaged with indigenous autonomy developing during this time? Like they were actively engaging, trying to get Yucky and Mayo and like other indigenous communities to join the focos of the PLM and like foment revolution with them. Right. I, that is true. I don't know the ins and outs of, of how that all worked. I mean, so, you know, there's a really distributed movement throughout Mexico and the United States. Uh, and so uh, there were, you know, powerful or important liberal clubs, PLM clubs, in the mining towns and then in uh, indigenous villages. I think particularly in Veracruz, I'm not entirely sure who was with the Yaqui, per se. I know this guy Palomares was, was an important agent who you know, came from this indigenous Mayo background. And the Mayo are adjacent to the Yaqui in Sonora. So I think there was like a lot of communication between them. I know that Tarahumara and I think it's the Cocopa, but I, I might have that, yeah, that name wrong, in Baja, California were very involved in the struggles in Tijuana and the, the north of the country. In uh, Veracruz, there was a lot of indigenous clubs as well. So I don't know the mechanics, though, per se, of how that worked. Other than that, you know, again, copies of the manifesto and of the newspaper were sent to the villages and to the mining centers, read to the people so they could learn about these ideas or, or learn about this, this, this program, work towards it, and they were constantly being solicited for their ideas and opinions. There was always kind of news stories being published about their, their despoilation and degradation and exploitation. And, you know, there are various agents and writers and, uh, you know, throughout all of these uh, locales writing about and agitating for, for their liberation. If you would like to support The Final Straw, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow and share our materials online, as well as give us feedback via the links at tohsr.wtf slash tree as in link tree. To support our transcription work and wider project, you can subscribe to us via patreon.com slash tfsr. You can also buy some merch or find donation methods at tfsr.wtf slash support. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Hello, and welcome to Live Like the World is Dying, your podcast for what feels like the end times. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. You can find my podcast wherever you get your podcasts or get them from the Channel Zero Network. So, like, it's it's funny to talk about the like liberal movement or the liberal party when talking about Ricardo Flores Magón, but like no person is just one set of ideas throughout their life. Like people develop, they grow, they change for the better or for the worse. But so RFM and his siblings and other comrades like came up through this liberal framework as we are identifying the rights of the individual, the rights to like have a say in governance, the right to a private holding of property as a defense against like 
you know, against dictators or, or what have you. And his ideas developed like, and, and like those of everyone with him developed a long, a long time, but they continued calling themselves liberal. And like you point out in private letters that Ricardo sent to his brother Enrique, disclosing his anarchist ideas, but wanting them to keep them under wraps in the Regeneración and in the work of the, the Junta um, of the PLM, the organizing committee of the of the Partido Liberal Mexicano, so as not to alienate the other junta members and the wider PLM yeah. membership, and this seems like a double bind. It's been pointed to by like by you, by other authors, by people sure. like later on in his life. Um, this also helped to keep the R. It kind of like in one way helped to keep RFM and the other junta members safer from prosecution under proto red scare laws in the U S such as the 1903 anarchist exclusion act, AKA the immigration act of 1903. But if there's, if there's this presumption that it's going to alienate the membership of the wider group, but if he wants to participate in this liberatory movement that he believes should be participated in by each individual in their communities as liberated individuals, it's kind of this difficult position. How do we not alienate the existing people that have these ideas? And how do we also, and not put ourselves into like undue pains of like, losing solidarity from a socialist left or getting imprisoned by the, the country we're like trying to agitate from, but simultaneously they're not actively by name planting these ideas in the Mexican consciousness. And yet there was like an anarchist influence in the Mexican revolution, whether it be like the anarchistic ideas that Zapata and company promoted or like, tragically their their enemies in the Casa del Obrero, Obrero Mundial and their syndicalism. Like a lot of these ideas, a lot of these people had read Regeneración or its related papers for a long time. And these created, these like helped to plant the seeds of what would later become the Mexican Revolution. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your views of like where you think he was coming from and what you think in your understanding, like the impacts of that was. Yeah, so it's a complicated question. So, so uh, the liberal movement in Mexico is, I, I'm not an expert in it, you know, uh, but it, it's variegated. And a really important thing is, you know, it was this guy, Benito Juarez, who was this indigenous, dark-skinned guy, you know, who walked from Oaxaca to Mexico, became the president, and, you know, made, like, popular education a right for all indigenous, for all people. He really did struggle for the rights of the people. At the same time, though, there, there, you know, the liberal movement came with other aspects, uh, as well as, a, you know, fighting off authoritarianism, it also promoted, you know, this private property, acquisition of private property. So it's a complicated movement. Identifying yourself with the liberalism of Juarez, you know, the, the great, you know, indigenous president of Mexico who really fought for the people, I, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, and, and you yourself seem to be very aware of, of all the great things that the Juarez's movement and La Reforma did for the, the, the people of Mexico. So I don't want to downplay that. Anyways, why did Flores Luan identify as a liberal and when did he? That is a good question. So in 1901, the liberal movement, per se, restarted. So it's the 1860s under, under Juarez, and then there was this dictator, the conservative Diaz, the Porfiriato. So in 1901, there was this coalition of, you know, kind of wealthy liberals and more radicals, like Flores Magon. So it was a pretty broad-based movement, politically at least. And they were all de dedicated to this singular goal, which was getting rid of the dictator who was just, just bringing uh, this unimaginable suffering and degradation to uh, the people of Mexico, uh, you know, expropriating the land, ex you know, enslaving the people, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that coalition was politically important for the immediate aim of getting rid of the dictator. Uh, you know, by, by at least 1902, uh, you know, Flores Magan was publishing The Conquest of Bread in translation, or, or he commissioned a paper to do so. By 1901, various, not, not just Flores Magan, but other, you know, so-called liberals had read and were aware of, like, anarchist thinking from Proudhon and Kropotkin and others. 
That said, so uh, Flores Brown, you know, uh, by 1906, you know, published the manifesto and is the Partido Liberal Mexicano, compiled all this stuff from all these villagers, campesinos, and, and industrial workers, you know, these broad based and it was a reformist. It was not only reformist, but it was sort of nationalist plan. Incredible progressive things, uh, details uh, that really would have benefited in a very dramatic way the rights of, of the people, uh, you know, the, the labor rights, the uh, land rights, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, it wasn't quite an anar- it wasn't an anarchist document at that point. It was it was focused on um, reforms, on, on making kind of concrete changes in people's lives that would have really benefited their, their material condition. I, that's decent. I, I have no problem with that, yeah. At the same time, though, uh, you know, Flores Brown was becoming more and more uh, anarchist, or maybe always was anarchist, yeah? But he wasn't open about it. And, and so in 1908, we have proof of this, that you know, he writes this letter to uh, his brother and to Quixidens Guerrero saying, we have to keep on with our revolutionary agitation, and everything we do has to be anarchist. You know, we have to be um, always promoting the expropriation of property, the destruction of the state, the destruction of the church, but we have to go under the guise of liberalism because if we are too open about our anarchism, we are going to frighten off our supporters who think of you know anarchism as just you know wanton violence and destruction. And then you see that maybe not today, maybe. Today, anarchism has a, a better reputation than it has had for, for a long time. But, you know, anarchism is, is commonly just associated with just, like, destruction, just mindless destruction. Now, why did Flores Magan do this? Was it a bad call or not? At this point, Flores Magan had already alienated, like, the rich, uh, the rich liberals. Camilo Arriaga, uh, who is this rich landowner, and, and Francisco Madero, who was also a rich landowner, were already like, you know, this guy is, is just a radical wacko. So why did he hold it back from the workers? Why did he hold it back from the peasants or the campesinos? Was it a good call or not? I mean, a lot of people, I, I don't know if I can really weigh in authoritatively on this. A lot of people have said, no, actually, the people were ready. You know, people were ready for, for more radical messages. People had, you know, suffered the depredations of capitalism, of the state, of the church. You know, there was literal enslavement. There was debt slavery, you know, slavery to the company store, slavery on the plantations. People were perhaps already ready for these messages. But not all the people. And, and, and I guess that there is like a pretty... Uh, I mean, there's just such a goddamn broad scope of membership, you know, distributed across two countries that not only am I sure that he would have alienated people, but he did alienate people when he came out as an anarchist, or at least became more forward in his anarchist ideas. He lost uh, a considerable amount of, of support from the U.S. left, the socialist left, Eugene Debs sort of backed off from him. Samuel Gompers and the AFL backed off from him. And then in Mexico, too, uh, there were some kind of key figures. Juan Sarabia, um, I think uh, Guterres Alara, but I might be wrong about that, sort of backed off uh, of him and said, no, you're a little bit too radical. So, uh, I mean, I think I think in the end, I think I think I, I would hope to believe that that, yeah, he should have been more forward, more open about his uh, actual political aspirations, and people would have responded to it. And in fact, as you bring up yourself, like the Zapatista movement did pick up on it. There, there were channels of communication between the Maganista movement and the Zapatista movement. They, they you know, had read his literature. They were using his language. There were other people throughout Mexico who had read for generation, who were, like, ready for it. And... Uh, when the Mexican Revolution did break out under Madero, there was a significant amount of confusion about Madero's relationship to Flores Magón. Some people, well, Madero actually put out this, this myth that, oh, it's the same movement. 
You know, we're working for the same aims. Uh, Flores Magan is going to be my vice president. So there, there were actually anarchists fighting for Madero because they, they believe so strongly in Flores Magan, fighting for liberal reforms on behalf of personalismo. I mean, that's why all the all these articles about personalismo, about don't follow a leader, become important. It was sort of a little bit too late to make that distinction once the revolution had broken out. I mean, I mean he did, and he did, even before then, speak about, you know, don't put your faith in politicians. But, yeah, at that point, I, I think he hobbled himself and his own possibilities for his own anarchist vision of the Mexican Revolution by not sufficiently, you know, propagating his message beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know, like, yeah, uh, yeah. (laughs) I I guess I can only speculate so much, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as like a media producer myself, like I can kind of see this idea of like, well, I got to, I got to curate the message so that I don't like, you know, push too many people away, you know, don't blow yeah. their minds too much, but, you yeah. know, you'd sort of like wean them on this or whatever, which is kind of patronizing, <laughs> not kind yeah. of, it is. <laughs> but um, yeah, so let's talk about like personalismo for a second. I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about this personalism, the idea of like, it's sort of like a patronage sort of idea it seems to carry a lot of elements of religiosity to it and the oh. term magonism has you know is used by historians all the time when talking about it, and it was used right. by contemporaries yeah. to talk about adherence to or affiliates of the plm um, or to the anarchist movement in the version of the essay persons die but noble ideas are eternal that appeared um, uncensored on the anarchist library you make the point that this is just what competitors of the PLM did during the life of RFM, like Madero saying, yeah, yeah, we are like, you know, we're going to announce that Ricardo Flores Magón is going to be the vice president. And like, we are liberals with a capital L. You are already a part of our army. And then also what his co-opters did in the Mexican state um, and historians have done frequently since, but co-opters since his death, uh, attempting to like bring him into the fold of, the uh, history of revolutionary Mexico that they claim the mantle of and that they present that they are in the uh, the long line of. Does that make sense? Like, bringing him into so, the yeah, rotunda yeah, yeah, of, yeah. like, yeah. So, yeah, yeah um, a, lot, a lot of stuff to say. So, uh, in his second play, uh, there's a character uh, in the play, and, you know, he makes some declaration about how, you know, the people should be freed from capitalist enslavement, what have you. And uh, uh, the villain... It's like, are you a Maganista? And the character's like, no, you know, I'm, I don't follow anybody. I'm not a, I'm, I believe in human liberty. I, I believe that people should be free, but I'm not a follower. Uh, you know, I read Regeneration. It's a great newspaper, you know, but I don't <laughs> idolize this man, you know? These are great ideas. And, uh, yeah, so Florsman really had to make this point again and again, especially during the Mexican Revolution. There was, again, there was, there was figure after figure, First Madero, then Carranza, then Obregón, Huerta, a couple others, I'm sure, that I just can't think of. And each one was like, hey, I'm the leader of the movement. Trust me, and I will put into place all these reforms that will liberate the people. Again and again, he, was, he said, you know, don't trust individuals, you know. Don't put your faith in, in you know, that's like putting your faith in in." in the state, in the church, like in representationism, right? Don't trust someone to represent yourself. Like, fight for the liberation of the people. You know, fight for the reform of the land. Fight for the justice of labor. Fight for, you know, the right of people to live like an equal, equitable, happy, decent life. But don't tr- put your trust in anyone. And, you know, I, I think a great example of, um, of this is... Um, you know, the Zapatista movement, yeah, like Marcos, yeah. right? Marcos was the figurehead of the Zapatistas for many years, you know, and people viewed him as like the leader of the movement. And he had done a really pretty excellent job, I think, of trying to fade himself out and be like, no, it's really not about me. You know, I, I like to write these wacky essays, <clears throat> I'm a, you know, but, but, it's the movement is about the people making their own lives, making their own autonomy. It's not about individualism. 
or not about the individual. I, I think it's very easy for us to fall into this habit of, you know, representing movements as being around a single person. But it, it's, it's sort of an, uh, uh, maybe an authoritarian habit of thought to always to rely on representation or to think that, that, you know, we can represent a popular movement by a single person. That's a dangerous sort of shorthand. And, you know, that, it's pretty, well, pretty widespread. I mean, you could also make the argument, you know, certain aspects of, like, identity, the idea of identity itself, uh, you know, as being, um, as somehow encompassing the, the complexity of, um, you know, popular movements, popular desires of, of the variegated forces at play. That, that's also, like, a dangerous habit to fall into. So uh, the idea of personality is, is actually, like, I think of uh, as a pretty broad, a broad concept, not, not, not only the politics, but, but, but in more generally about how we think about ourselves, about the world, about identity, and so forth. At least politically, it's, 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 it's important. You know, don't, don't follow leaders. You know, fight for the people, fight for freedom, fight for dignity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is a point that you've written about, too. In the 1906 platform of the Liberal Party junta, there was a clear nationalistic tone against the holding of yeah. lands by foreign investors. Right. But it also included a call to deport Chinese laborers for undermining, quote right. unquote, undermining the wages of Mexican citizens mirroring anti-Chinese popularism wielded in the USA. Uh, this runs very counter to the PLM allies, like later allies, like the IWW and WFM, or the, or the Western right. Federation of Miners, which helped to found the IWW. And as you pointed out in the bio um, at the start of Dreams of Freedom, the penning of this became a point of regret for Magon later in his life. Maybe you didn't put it that way, but it seems to run counter to the perspective that he expressed in his internationalism later on. Can you talk yeah. about shifts from nationalism to international internationalism in yeah. RFM's views yeah. and like the ideas carried by the papers that he worked on and what sort of impact do you think it had on the Mexican revolutionary movement? So, you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, Flores Magon, that, that 1906 document, I mean, it's it's sort of the dangers uh, or the potential perils of anti-colonialism in general, you know. So, absolutely right. Like the American industry was expropriating land labor, you know, like crazy in, in throughout Mexico, and and you know the Diaz dictatorship actively encouraged American industries to come and you know expropriate you know, land, uh, expropriate from the people, expropriate resources, expropriate labor. So absolutely right. You know, absolutely good point. However, yeah, there was this nationalist tone which carried over to, the, to the, this anti-Chinese sentiment. And there's this language throughout the text of like, you know, the la, la patria, yeah? La patria is, you know, it's, it's the country, but it's also like the fatherland. It's, it's this sort of very macho, language throughout the document, you know, and it's sort of like, you know, foreign capital is kick, kicking us down like we're a bunch of wussies, you know, and we have to like stand up for our manhood and push back the foreigners. So that, that was a thing. I also have to say that, that I don't know whether or not, but, but his brother Jesus married a woman named Clara Hong, H-O-N-G, I don't know if that woman was Chinese. I don't know if Hong is a common Mexican name. So there, there might be something else there too. Um, some uh, not personal, but but something weird about the anti-Chinese part. And and that, that anti-Chinese provision may have, you know, not probably did not emerge from the mind of Flores Magon himself. You know, it probably was solicited from the the readership. You know, from the readership, and it is true. You know, I mean. We all know that, you know, that, you know, surplus population leads to lowering of wages and that, you know, importing people who work for, for less, you know, is hard on the economic welfare of, of, of the working class. That, 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 that's, that's true, you know. But the answer to that is not to uh, insist on their uh, exclusion, but rather to kind of uh, fight for the internationalization. Of, of labor rights 
Anyways, so, so yeah, so later in his life, as Flores Magan moves from Mexico to the United States and becomes involved with the U.S. left, so, you know, the U.S. socialists are helping him out. The IWW is very involved in uh, organizing the mines in Cananea, in uh, Sonora, in Arizona, which is exactly the same places where the, the Flores Magan party is. So th- those two movements uh, kind of flow together in a lot of interesting ways. A lot of the people who were special delegates for the uh, Flores Magan movement were also, um, for the Maganisa movement, were also uh, members of the, the Western Federation of Miners, who was the early uh, version of the IWW. So, so there's that aspect of internationalism. And then, and then like, as time goes on, uh, he becomes more and more cognizant or pronounced about realizing that the scope of the struggle is not just, uh, you know, this national elimination of the church and the state and capital, but, but, but an international struggle. And that really comes to a head during World War I, you know, during this, why are you going to war against the people from another country? They're not your, your enemies. The enemy is, you know, international capital, the, the state system. And, you know, all men are brothers, all men are exploited, and women, whatever, all people are exploited, and we all have to, um, you know, fight together to um, liberate humanity as a whole. So, yeah, that's an important trajectory, the, the movement from, from, you know, his early, I don't know if it's his early or if it's the, uh, the, the, the party's early uh, kind of nationalistic tenor to, to his internationalist statements. Later. So I guess I had one other question, um, and that would be about Ricardo's legacy. I became aware of uh, Ricardo Flores Magón when AK published this book and simultaneously was learning about the Maganista groups, or, you know, <laughs> there I am using that term. But uh, Yeah, sure. It's, it's hard not to. Yeah. Involved in the 2006 uprisings in uh, Ricardo's home oh, yeah. state of Oaxaca, particularly... Right. The one that like ringed out to me was Sipo RFM. There was like right. uh, right. groups, but there were like Apo affiliated groups, yeah. like organizing in Northern California among um, generalized like people in solidarity. But mostly, there's a lot of Oaxacanos of various like nations living yeah. in that area, and so there was a group called Campo uh, Comité de Apoyo de Movimiento sure. Popular. Yeah, whatever, whatever. What? But- yeah, yeah, definitely. So the timing of the publication uh, seemed pretty perfect, and it's cool that you were able to reference, like, right now there's these struggles against uh, Ulises uh, Ruiz. Um, But I wonder if you could talk about, you know, during the teacher strikes in in those periods that um, were brutally, brutally repressed, but also seemed like they created an opportunity for, like, amazing flourishing of organizing and people creating alternatives to the existing world around them. And they were obviously like a lot of people were pulling from this legacy of like the, the really strong revolutionary legacy of like, you mentioned that like Juarez was from there, that, that RFM was from there. But anyway, but yeah, could you talk about RFM's legacy uh, to your understanding, like where you've seen ripples from that? So I, 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 About the 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 SIPO and all of that and the Oaxaca 2006, I, I um, unfortunately was not down. There. I was down there in 2005. I, I missed that everything in 2006. But um, I, I did some. I, I did a little bit of activism with them. I got busted by the government for doing that. So I, I did some. I just wound up doing journalism about it instead. And dude, it's the same shit. It's the same fucking shit. Like a hundred years after Flores Magon, it's the same that stuff as always. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's 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 you know, capitalism and the state is uh, down there. You know, just creating misery in manifold ways. You know, enslaving people in the tobacco farms again. I think now it's moved on to like the narco terroristas. Uh, you know, drug manufacturing as well you know again you know there's impunity impunidad by the government there's there's you know miscarriages of justice there's a uh, wanton you know just murder murder of activists just just all kinds of crazy shit just happening all the fucking time down there like that is really like the normal state of affairs 
I think maybe throughout the world, just this, this, this horror, this ongoing horror, this ongoing like resource extraction, human degradation, it's just constant. Uh, I was amazed to see, you know, just the same shit that, that Flores Magan was writing about a hundred years ago still goes on all the fucking time in Mexico. Anyways, uh, to mm-hmm. the point of uh, Flores Magan's uh, influence, you know, he was, he's a brilliant writer. I mean, he's just, he's just so ardent in his belief. It's his heart, you know, his body might have been worn away from imprisonment, uh, from running around all the time, but his belief is is so beautiful, so strong, so pure. His language is magnificent. I mean, it's 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 sort of like over the top, at least for our like, you know, white bread, white boy years, you know. But it's 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 gorgeous. It's gorgeous language. It's gorgeous thinking, and people have read it and they love it. And it's it's a powerful message. It's in widely influential. You know, Sandino started off reading a lot of his stuff. The Constitution of Mexico, the labor reforms came from the Maganista movement. There's that word again. <laughs> and then, yeah, um, you know, 1968, the student uprisings in Mexico City, they quoted, you know, was, was, was Flores Magan a sellout? You know, no. You know, he was, you know, he, he fought for human dignity. And, dude, there's a lot of, like, like the Mexican anarcho punk scene, yeah, the anarchist scene in Mexico, which is why I learned about it. I was just sort of hanging out on a beach in Mexico, and people told me, you know, these Mexican anarcho punks, it's a fucking, it's a great scene. Like there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of very interesting and powerful anarchist energy, and it's just outright. It's just in the open. It's not awkward and and. Uh, self-questioning uh, as it is in the United States. And a lot of that comes from the, you know, the strength of the tradition, which comes from the, you know, this, the writings of Flores Magon and the, you know, the other members of the, of the uh, PLM. As far as the, the Oaxacan Sipo and the CODEP and, uh, yeah, I mean, so it's, I think it's important for people to be able to to draw on that writing, to draw on that those ideas, that tradition of thinking, and to point back to it, be able to reference it, to be able to quote, quote it. But you know, honestly, at the same time, Flores Magan was was writing from. You know, he came from a small village in Oaxaca, Aluxuchitlan, uh, and so the story goes. You know, his father, who was um, probably indigenous, but I don't know, 100%, made the point that, you know, people, you know, help each other out, you know, they support each other. And I, I visited Aluxa Chitlan, yeah, uh, mm. in 2005, and they were doing a thing called tequio, yeah, which is just community labor. And it just, like, people all just, like, get together, like, when a road needs to be built, they just get together as a town and they just all do the communal labor together. They don't do it through government. I mean, there are people, you know, organizing, but it's not like a, an elected government that, that calls the, you know, that orders people to do things. There aren't. And that's a common indigenous practice. This tequios is common in Mexico, throughout Mexico. And, you know, first man writes about this in, you know, one of my favorite essays is, you know, the Mexican people are ready for communism. And he makes this point. He's like, you know, for like hundreds of years, you know, people in Mexico, they just got along when when people, when, when Pedro's house needed to be built, everybody in the town would get together and build Pedro's house, you know. People, you know, just took from the land, they, you know, where I'm now, you know, the, the uh, I'm now in Cambodia, yeah, and the guy made the same point. It was like, hey, there's all this rice fields, and uh, it just belongs to the community. People just go out, and they just harvest rice. It's just out there, and just people just take it. Nobody owns it. It's just everybody's, just anybody's, nobody's, yeah? 
that's sort of the normal state of things. That's just how people live together. That's how it is in indigenous communities and, and actually in a lot of the world. You know, I don't want to mystify, you know, this idea of, of indigenous. It's, it's just how people get along. And there's only, uh, he made, of course, when he makes the point in his essay, you know, people only were aware of the government when the taxes were levied or when um, Diaz would come by looking for soldiers for the army, you know? But, but most of their life, they were just sustaining themselves. They were sustaining their family. They were sustaining their community. They were being supported by their, by their community as well. That's sort of the normal state of affairs. So that, that's my way of saying that, yes, Flores Magon has influenced indigenous movements in an important way, but also, you know, his the roots of anarchist thinking are already indigenous, you know, at least in Forest Magan. I mean, this, this idea, it's not a fucking, it's not a complicated idea. Yeah. You know, anarchism isn't a complicated idea. Just like help each other out, you know, don't be greedy. Don't be a jerk, you know, just help each other out. And, and that's, that's, you know, uh, you know, the declaration of this is mine, this is not yours is a weird move to make it's 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 an imposition of force by the state by the capital by the church and most of humanity doesn't actually think and doesn't actually act that way it's it's this weird imposition of power um and we just need to get away from that and for most of human history People have lived like that, and, and that those are communities which are indigenous. But there's nothing uh, magical about indigeneity. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just that's the way people are. They just work together. Hmm. Well, cool. Yeah, thank you, for, thank you for that. That makes a lot of sense. And I like the way that you ended that, like, with simplicity. Mitchell, are you working on any other projects now, or is there a place, any places um, listeners can find more of your writings that you'd suggest? Sure. So I, I have a bunch of stuff on the Anarchist Library. So my actual project is is called The Anarchism of the Other Person, and it's basically the idea that that our, our liberation, our being, our existence is actually constituted in and through other people. Yeah, we, we, even the idea of the ego, yeah, of I myself, you know, I am for myself, this, this kind of sternerite line is this weird uh, authoritarian, well, it's autarky, it's, it's self rule, yeah, it's not anarchy, okay, anarchy is, is the disruption even of egoism and individualism. And then our, our, our existence is, you know, uh, materially and uh, genetically produced from and through other people. Kropotkin makes this point a hundred times, you know, that, that we are born into this world made by other people, you know. So how, how could we even begin to think, this is my thing? And anyway, so, so I've been working on that project more or less for a super long time. And I've published things about it. About 10 years ago, I started to combine that line of thinking with, with uh, like feminist writings, uh, particularly around like care ethics, mothering ethics, nurturing ethics. And so I, I wrote some work on uh, you know, anarchism as a practice of care. So I read that a while ago, and then um, my uh, colleague, friend, teacher, Kiara Botici, who just published this book on anarcho feminism, she wrote me a couple of years ago saying, Oh, Mitchell, you know, that work that you were doing about anarchism and care is really important, especially now during COVID. You know, you have to get back to work on that. So I have been working on that. I've, I've written a couple of essays and a couple of talks on anarchism, care ethics, mothering, nurturing. And uh, still working on it, yeah, but sort of in the background of a lot of other stuff going on in my life. But I hope to someday produce something wonderful with it. There, 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 there are a couple essays on the Anarchist Library. There's a couple of videos on YouTube 
you can just like Google my name, you'll find my stuff. So cool. Yeah, I'll put some yep. links in the show notes for sure that'll make it easier for folks. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for like being, as you mentioned, that you're in Cambodia. <laughs> Thanks for being willing to right. make this work. This is awesome. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. And right, uh, yeah, so keep much. in touch. Yeah. yeah of course. All right, YouTubers, yeah. All right. Take care, Mitchell. All right. Take care. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say? What you say? Marriage is stupid. It's a legal institution where two people who love one another subject each other to oppression. Requiring the person they love to make promises to love them no matter what they do or who they become. In marriage, you make a promise today as the person you are to love the other person, not just as they are, but as they will be, no matter who they become and no matter who you become. How do I know that 10, 20, 50 years from now, I'm not going to absolutely despise you? It's just fantastical thinking to look at the person who stands before you and declare that in the millions and millions of possible futures, there's not a single one where the love of your life, over a long enough trajectory, becomes an insufferable asshole. Some loved ones don't even take that long. You don't have to time them with a calendar. You can use a sundial or even a stopwatch. Or, if it's me, you don't have to time me at all. I was born this way. The annulment for my current marriage was recently filed, which what got me thinking about pondering all of the reasons marriage is stupid. First and foremost among those, of course, is the simple reality that you can't promise how you'll feel in the future. The future you and the future loved one are strangers to each other, and there's no knowing how they'll feel about one another. But beyond that, marriage is a really terrible institution that serves patriarchal and hierarchical interests more than it serves the people who participate in it. Marriage serves a long tradition of fathers giving away daughters to their husbands. This is more than a symbolic gesture. Historically, the marriage ceremony represents a public acknowledgement of a transfer of ownership. Daughters are the property, and the title transfers from the father to the husband, from patriarch to patriarch. With the ring slid onto a finger, a husband becomes the proud owner of his own baby machine. And the ring itself is significant. Consider the long history in animal husbandry. Animal husbandry of the husband putting rings to the noses of his cattle. The ring signifies ownership. We no longer pound the rings through the septums of the bride's noses, but slide the rings onto bride's fingers. Patriarchy's come a long way, I guess. But marriage also serves a number of hierarchical interests. Marriage is a kind of gateway to inheritance and a whole host of other privileges and advantages not bestowed on the unmarried. In hierarchic thinking, marriage makes a relationship legitimate. And so, when we participate in marriage, whatever our motives, we legitimize the hierarchical system that promotes the institution. The hierarch system has historically reserved the right to define marriage and to control who can get married. Those alienated and refused recognition lose privileges afforded to those who are married. Thus, the struggle, for instance, for gay marriage. Early on in that struggle, my mom made an interesting observation. She supported gay marriage, but not for any principled reason. She supported it simply because she didn't understand why straight couples should have the monopoly on making each other miserable. She said that while my dad was standing right there. <laughs> and so, we get to my biggest objection to the institution of marriage, and that's this. Marriage is a process of mutual oppression, and it's, it's a demand made upon a lover and a partner that they chain themselves to you and promise to stick around even if you make them miserable, and vice versa. It's a very unloving thing to do, to demand that the other promise to make that kind of a sacrifice. Frankly, I don't want you to stick around if I make you miserable. And I'm certainly not inclined to take your abuse and stick with you if I'm miserable. And that is the promise. 
Who would do that? If two people are loving and responsive to each other's needs, and if they plan to continue to be, then they'll both remain happy in a relationship. And happy people don't abscond. So there's no need for a marriage between happy, loving people. No need for a promise to stick around. I guess I'm just not marrying material. That's what it says all over social media, anyway. As spouses go, I'm a regular Darth Vader. I think the compulsion to marriage is an urge we have for stability and permanence. We want to feel like we've got this issue tackled, much like when we make that final car payment or when our new coffee table gets delivered from Ikea. But there is no permanence in the world. There's now. And so we have to value and love our partners right now and struggle to hold on to those good moments as long as we can make them last. It's all we have. A certificate signed by a government bureaucrat can't extend the life of that love. Only we can. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max. If you're disavowing archaic institutions, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four. 3205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 You can find his past writings updates on his case hear his past audio find out how to get his books plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org this is The Final Straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.